recording. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to people around the world. This is Martin Hubel, your host of the DB Tonight Show, and we are at show number 234. Wow, how time flies when you're, or how 10 years or 12 years fly when you're having fun. Today, my uh, special guest is John Hornibrook from the uh, IBM Toronto Lab. How are you today, John? I'm doing fine, Martin. How about you? Good, good. We've got warm weather. It's a bit rainy today, but we had uh, a killer day yesterday. It could have been late May. It was just so beautiful out there. And uh, Fantastic. Unfortunately, we're back in lockdown, so my mood is a little uh, sort of gray, but uh, not much we can do about that. We're getting through this. We're getting people vaccinated, and hopefully we'll be all set uh, sometime in the early fall to re, uh, start to resume a distance normal life. So with that in mind, let me get through the um, the for, the formalities at the beginning, and we'll turn it over to you for your wonderful presentation. Now, as always, here's our social media page. Uh, the big things to watch is hashtag db 2 night on Twitter. And also, if you like, you don't have to download anything anymore. You can d replace right off YouTube, so life is good. There's our disclaimers, everything's being recorded, we respect uh, copyrights and all that type of thing. And uh, as always, our little uh, agenda for what we're going through. Uh, the main thing we've got coming up is our next show is uh, Piotr Mercijewski of the uh, IBM Toronto Lab. He's the executive in charge of the whole shebang when it comes to DB2LUW. So you do want to hear what he's got to say. And, and I know uh, Peter is uh, very uh, personable. I know you'll enjoy the presentation. Uh, the, the Z shows, we have Mariella Wyrock uh, coming up in April, talking on uh, uh, both of these seem to have database change theme to it because the next one as well is uh, Steen Rasmussen of Broadcom talking on implementing schema changes. But we're at that period in, in DB2 on uh, Z or Z where um, schema changes are a big part of the things going on in the in the uh, uh, in the Z world along with the application development things they're doing. So uh, we're looking forward to those shows as well. I've got uh, some things lined up for June and I. Was almost going to bring them out today, but I'd like to finalize them. I'll have more information on, for the April 23rd show on what will be happening in June. But we're in good shape to finish off the year with a big bang. Uh, another important thing for DBO, DBI, our founding sponsor of the DB Tonight Show, they're having their uh, latest and greatest web suite demo. Uh, on Thursday, April 22nd at 11, uh, to make it easy, we put the registration link on the DB2 Night Show homepage. Uh, you can sign up there. The attendance is already looking very good for it. And uh, as usual, we also have the standard uh, DBI uh, webinars available off their sites as well. So you, those are easily found on the DB2 Night Show homepage. And our winner last uh, show was Mark Madsen of Discover, and he's got a, an Amazon gift certificate coming your way, Mark. Congratulations. And our sponsors are DBI and myself, Martin Hubel Consulting, Inc. And uh, we've been doing this quite a while now. I guess I've been involved with the show for about nine years now. And all right, now we're into our polling questions, and we have our standard polls, and we also have the polls that are important to uh, to the uh, to the topics today so let's ask the normal question here what uh, versions of db2 luw are you currently running i believe you can do all the ones that you want to do at this point hopefully at some point we'll make that uh, Get rid of that V97 off there. There's some people that just won't let go. It's application packages and compatibility and that sort of thing. Okay, we've got enough people voted on that. We'll share the results. And we see that uh, we've got 11.1 uh, and 11.5 out there. 
All right, next question. What other DBMSs do you run? Oh. <laughs> All right, we've got the answers to this. And, uh, it's interesting. We've got a number of people that uh, I know are registered. We've got our registration quite high, but we don't have the people on the show yet. I think we'll be seeing people join as we go along here. And here's our our results for that. Was but he's running DB twos and. This re question relates to the show. Which explain tools are you currently using? I, I made this, uh, choose any and all that you want to put down, just to see what people are doing. And uh, we've got a wide variety here. Everybody on the show, of course, if you're attending something on optimization, you've been using Explain all along. We see that most people are using DB2 Explain. Some people are using DB2 EXFMT and the Visual Explain gets used where appropriate, I am sure. And uh, do you have automatic run stats? Are you using the automatic run stats features? The answer seems to be so far on some databases. And uh, we'll, we'll close that off. I think people that have had a chance to vote, you know, we got 75% um, on some and uh, another person saying no. That's interesting to know. And we'll hide that and move on to our last question here, which is, do you use optimization profiles? Interesting, we have some people using optimization profiles. And we have people voted on that, so we'll close that off and share the results. And 75% uh, no, 25% yes. It uh, doesn't take much to make that 25%. Our audience seems to be a little, our studio audience seems to be a little small today, but uh, personally, I, I've been actually trying to get people not to use that, but there you go. Okay, that takes us to uh, back to our presentation here. John, I'll turn it over to you. You're ready? Let me see how I back in here and uh, I'm make, making you the presenter. Great, thanks. Let me just <clears throat> hope this. Uh... There we go. OK, looking you're looking good. You're looking good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Martin. So <clears throat> uh, for today's session, I'm, uh, I'm just going to cover basically query optimization and, and how it works in DB2 LUW. So you could, the 101, <clears throat> you know, familiar with uh, uh, university courses is kind of like your basic primer on, uh, on how query optimization works. So hopefully cover in the in the next uh, 40 minutes or so are, you know, basically what is query optimization and, you know, why is it important for performance? And then I'm going to go into the architecture somewhat uh, to explain how optimization is done within LUW, uh, how catalog statistics are used by query optimization. They're very, very important. It's kind of the lifeblood of the optimizer. I'm going to go into some examples of how the optimizer costs access plan and chooses the, the best one. And then so kind of throughout the whole presentation, I'll be using some explain examples and hopefully you'll get some uh, experience uh, uh, in, ter in terms of how to interpret those. So 
first, let's talk about why bother optimizing queries. So really it's all about performance. Um, you know, for some complex queries, it can be many orders of magnitude difference between, you know, optimizing and not optimizing. And, uh, you know, and we want to make using relational databases and writing SQL easy. Um, <clears throat> low, you know, in the, in the whole theme of lowering the total cost of ownership. You know, writing queries and tuning them requires, you know, deep skills um, because, you know, there's some very complex database designs and, and the many millions of applications out there in the world. And SQL can can come from a variety of places, from SQL generators or from users who aren't familiar with SQL. And there's fewer and fewer skilled, you know, SQL tuners and database administrators available to to uh, tune them and make queries uh, faster. <clears throat> and uh, there's also many different types of, uh, you know, hardware and system configurations that uh, modern you know, a modern database like DB2 runs on, and so the optimizer has to take that into account in order to uh, provide the, the best performance. And so, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of factors that have to be taken into account um, in order in order to you know get the query to run properly. So, you know, memory, you know, how many CPUs. Um, well, you know, all modern systems now have multiple. Multi multiple CPUs and multiple cores, and DB2 has the ability to parallelize queries uh, across multiple processors. Got to consider the I/O bandwidth. Got to consider the communication bandwidth between different, uh, you know, systems in a in a database partition environment. And I'll, I'll go through, you know, this in more details. We'll go through this the session. You know, tables can be organized differently. Some can be database partitioned or range partitioned. And LUW supports this uh, concept of multi-dimensional clustering, and the and then the data can be in different formats. So DB2 supports uh, you know column organized table and row organized table, and the same relational engine is also used in the big SQL products. So the the data could live somewhere else in a in a Hadoop file system. Also got complex data types like XML to deal with, and uh, DB2 also supports a, a federation feature where it can. Uh, you know, you can catalog, register uh, tables and data sources across a variety of other databases or even flat files and spreadsheets and um, run queries against them. And we also have a, you know, the next generation of that data virtualization. So the optimizer has to be aware of, of these as well. And then there's other tuning <clears throat> options that you can use. You can create indexes, you can create materialized query tables, you can use compression. And again, the optimizer has to take that all into account. So what exactly is query optimization? So from, from a DB2 uh, kind of architecture perspective, uh, query optimization is a couple of steps within the entire SQL compilation process. And so the SQL compilation process is basically, you know, it takes, you know, the input is an SQL statement, which you see on the left-hand side of the screen. And the result is uh, something called an access section, which you see on the on the far right hand side. And the uh, access section is basically like a um, uh, basically like a byte code that's executed by the DB2 relational engine, and it's got uh, op operators and operands, you know, like a you know like a hardware uh, system or you know, you know, other types of systems that, that you know uh, operate on that principle. Except the you know the operators within a relational database are going to be kind of at the relational level. So they'll be, you know, for example, fetch a row from a table, or uh, you know, join this row with another row from a table. And so, you know, ultimately, you know, systems execute uh, you know operations in a sequence of instructions. And so the SQL compilations. You know, you know, job is to take the relational specification, procedural spec, you know, the uh, sort of the semantic specification of a query and, and turn it into the procedural set of steps. And then within that, there's the optimization phase. And within the DB2 LEW architecture, there's two steps. One is a query transformation, and the other one is the actual generation of the access plans. And I'm going to go through those in 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 great detail in this in this session. So 
Uh, and this page, I won't spend too, too uh, much time on it. It just puts, uh, it just outlines all the steps within uh, SQL compilation and uh, just highlights uh, where the rewrite and the optimization, uh, the access plan generation phases of optimization are within uh, the phases of SQL compilation. So just to <clears throat> stay within the time limits, I'm not going to spend too, too much time on uh, on this today. So the first part of the presentation, I'm going to you know, talk about what exactly is query transformation. So we also refer to it as uh, query rewrite. So as it sounds, it basically takes the original SQL and it turns it into a semantically equivalent form that uh, can be processed more efficiently by the database engine. So, you know, just, you know, just uh, you know, a very simple example is if a query, you know, had a select distinct, uh, you know, customer key and name from a customer table. Um, if there was a unique index on the customer key column, then query transformation could just remove the distinct because uh, it's it's already guaranteed to be di distinct by the by the fact there's a unique index. And so <clears throat> why why do we do query rewrites? So the, the main reason is uh, because there's you know multiple ways to uh, you know specify the same query with different forms of SQL. So you can you can basically you can you can get the same answer writing the SQL many different ways. And some of those, you know, some of those ways are not uh, as you know conducive to good performance as as others. And so the query rewrite uh, you know, optimization tries to you know transform that into something that will you know generally generally be better for execution. And of course, you know, talk about there's query generators that you know just produce you know, lots of redundancy and in inefficiencies, uh, and, and it's hard to hand opt hand optimize them because you know you don't have access to the to the source code that's generating the SQL. Uh, queries can be tremendously complex. They, some of them might not appear to be complex when you look at them, but they're referencing views and views, the views themselves could be very complex. And of course, with huge data volumes, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, very, very critical to, to, to um, you know, get these transformations correct because the, the penalty can be quite severe. So uh, let's look at a, uh, <clears throat> a specific example, an SQL statement. And we're just going to walk through some of the query transformations that are that are possible in in, in DB2. So this this query, uh, relatively simple. What it's what it's doing is it's uh, re returning the total and average shipping cost from a you know a database that has some you know sales and customer data. And it's looking specifically for you know sales that occurred through the catalog for New York State that had no returns for you know the 60 days starting April 1st, 20, 2018. So uh, you know the color coding kind of matches the uh, explanation in the in the little quote bubble on on the right. So you can see the you know the sum and the average that are recomputing for the ship cost. Uh, in order to to get that data it requires joining three tables. So the sales information is in this catalog sales table. And then, in order to to apply the um, the two filtering conditions, we do the filtering through uh, a date dimension and a customer address table. And this uh, predicate in gray this represents the 60 days from April 1st. And of course, the one in light blue is looking for for uh, New York State. And the and the more interesting search condition is this not exist predicate, which is what implements you know looking for. Uh, catalog sales that didn't have any returns. And what's interesting here is that this, um, you know, the search condition in, in the in the not exist predicate has to refer back, refer, it reference, it matches the catalog returns table to the catalog sales table This uh, with this with its predicate. So the first step in query compilation would be to parse that SQL statement and then internally uh, a graph representing uh, the statement is, is constructed, and so the the nodes in this graph are they represent uh, relational operations. So like select, uh, group by, you know a select node that uh, has multiple inputs essentially represents a, a join. 
So what I've shown here is the, the yellow boxes are the relational operations and the red boxes are either tables or uh, table functions. So in this case, they're, they're just all tables, all the tables that but we, we saw in that uh, original SQL statement. So you can see the three, the three tables that are joined here at this level, uh, select two is where all the search conditions are being applied. Um, the computation of the average and sum uh, shipping costs are, are done at this at the group by node. And then <clears throat> the uh, not exist subquery to find the uh, it, whether or not there was a catalog return is implemented by the select node three to the catalogs return table. And so what's interesting to highlight here is that select node two is what we call correlated to select node three. So that means that select node three has to execute for you know every qualifying row produced by select two, so essentially it's a it's a form of a of a loop that has to kind of continually be executed in order to to look for <coughs> catalog return rows. So after query rewrite or query transformation, uh, you know, three important things have happened to the query graph. The most important one is that that correlated not exist subquery has been converted to what we call an anti join. And so why is that important? That's important because it removed this, this correlation loop that was present in, in the original graph and it allows you know, this join, uh, this, this reference to the catalog returns to be done as a, as a join in, in one pass. And the, uh, and, and the DB2 LUW runtime engines has a, has a native support for uh, anti-join operations. So it can be done you know, very efficiently down in the, down in the runtime. And then the um, the next uh, transformation that was done was there was a you know a uh, date time computation to compute uh, 60 days past April 1st so that was you know folded out into or pre-computed into uh, May 31st and then the, uh, the the sum and the average were decomposed into a sum and a count count big in this case, just in case there's uh, the counts don't, so the counts don't overflow. And then the average is just computed as the, as the sum over the count. So this just gives an example of some of the, you know, the transformations that, that uh, can occur as part of uh, query transformations. So how does query query technology work in DB2? It's a, it's a heuristic or rule-based uh, engine. So when I say heuristic, it's, you know, it, basically follows certain principles such as, you know, it's it's almost always best to push filtering or predicates as close to the data access as possible. Uh, it's better to decorrelate whenever possible. Although there are some there are some exceptions to when correlation might actually be better when there's indexes, but in, in general, uh, it's best to be avoided in certain types of configurations. Uh, transforming subqueries, transforming subqueries to joins is is uh, usually a good idea because um, the join runtime implementation of DB2 is is more efficient than the subquery implementation, just because of the na the nature of the way subqueries, the semantics of subqueries. And then merging the query with the view definition <coughs> is is always a good idea. And so the architecture is is very extensible. It's you know comprised of a set of rules and a rule engine. Each rule is self-contained, and uh, uh, new rules can be uh, easily added, and uh, other ones can be disabled, you know, based on certain conditions. And uh, a number of rules have been added over the years. So at this point, um, there are about 140 rules in in the in the query transformation engine, and I'm only going to touch on a couple of them in this presentation. Um, it's a, an iterative uh, rule engine, so it will tra traverse the original query graph, um, you know, looking for certain patterns, and if those patterns are matched, it will uh, fire the rule, which will do the transformation, and that will it will just continue iterating through the query graph and until it reaches just steady, a steady state where there's no longer any rules to fire. Or you know, or you know, in, in the extreme cases, it it would it might hit a time uh, a time limit to say that's enough that's enough transformations. Otherwise, the preparation time could uh, could be too high. So I've already talked about. Uh, I'm going to skip this page because I've I've talked about uh, some of these transformations: view merge, subquery to join, 
you know, redundant, redundant join emulation is uh, you know, just basically if there's multiple references at the same table can be accomplished with a, with a single scan. Uh, some other examples of uh, transformations, uh, ones that can be done on search conditions or predicates. So for example, if you've got a, a not predicate over an or, uh, it's more efficient to apply De Morgan's law to that, to, to break that up and make those two ands, because then those two and predicates can be, those two subterms can be um, applied independently, perhaps one at an index scan and, and, and one at you know, some other point in processing. Um, another very important one is introducing uh, additional predicates based on existing predicates. We call this predicate transitive closure. So, you know, the first line shows the predicates that existed in the original SQL and the, and the next line uh, are the predicates that can be derived from those predicates. And that's really important, especially check those uh, local predicates on table two and T3 that could be derived from T1 and that just provides filtering closer to the access to those tables. So that um, <clears throat> that covers query transformation. Um, at this point, um, Martin, this might, might be a good time for you to run the sponsor. Okay, um, let, let me just um, uh, get control here. I think I need to make myself presenter again. And then I need to go in here and find this video. All right, Let's see what's happening here. Let me uh, go back to showing uh, my uh, screen here. And, and while I was minding my own business, I have company. He decided he'd come in and see you. There he is. He came in for cookies. So that's enough of him. Thank you so much for playing, Charlie. And I'll put things back to you, John. There we go. All you gotta do is click yes and we're back on. Perfect. All right, how's it look? Back where I, where I left off? Absolutely, you're back in. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Next uh, part of the presentation is about the access plan generation phase. So, yeah, get to the right slide. 
So the access plan generation phase, what it does is it, uh, it, an access plan is a, is a sequence of, uh, uh, it, it's a <clears throat> sort of a graph that represents a, the sequence of runtime operators uh, used in the SQL statement. And so it's a, a graph for each node is the operator and the edges represent the flow of data. Uh, the, the order of execution is generally left to right, uh, but there are some exceptions. The, probably the more important one is a hash join where the, the build table of the hash join is, is done first. So the build table will be on the right and then the, uh, the actual join will proceed with scanning the left-hand table, the probe table um, and probing into the build table. And so the way to, uh, to understand and see what the uh, access plan is, is that uh, we use the explain facility. We'll talk more about that in a few pages. So the, uh, the access plans are generated by uh, scanning the query graph that is passed to the optimization phase from uh, the query transformation phase. And the access plan is built uh, by scanning the query graph from the bottom up. So the first thing it does is it will build uh, subplans for accessing all the, you know, the tables or, or table functions. So it'll build things like table scans and index scans. And then once it's uh, produced all of those, it will start building plans for the relational operators that consume those tables. So then we proceed with joins and aggregation, union, order by, that type of thing. And so in order to, you know, uh, get things set up, collect some information for access plan generation, the optimizer will do multiple preparatory scans of the query graph to collect things such as uh, where is, uh, you know, data ordering interesting to the query, where, where is database partitioning interesting, where are keys, like things that represent uniqueness interesting. And there could be some, you know, dependencies uh, within the SQL itself that are represented in the query graph that the optimizer has to has to follow. For example, if uh, you know there's correlation and which requires, you know, reading one table before reading another table. So the, the access plan that's generated has to has to follow that, or the query is not going to execute properly. So uh, let's go through an example of uh, the access plan generation. Uh, again, this is going to be based on that uh, query I used in the query transformation example, and just looking at one of the nodes in the graph where the three tables were joined. So the you know the first phase would scan the the query graph, collect some information about those tables and and the join predicates, uh, looking for things where you know where is it interesting to maybe partition them? If it was a database partition environment, uh, you know maybe we can use orders uh, <clears throat> for you know, satisfying things like order buys or, you know, ordering can be used for certain types of joins. So all that information would be done in this first scan. And then the next pass would go through and build the base accesses for the tables. So this means, you know, for each table, it will consider what indexes exist. And, you know, for all of them, it will, uh, you know, typically build a table scan because that, that, you know, if, you know, if all else, the, you know, that a table scan can be used to, to access any table. And once it's collected up the various ways to access those tables, then it will start considering uh, if there are joins and then the various uh, ways the tables can be joined and the different combinations. So it will, you know, plan uh, all the two-way joins and three-way joins. And I'm going to go through an example of what we call the join planning or join enumeration uh, in, in a few pages. So, <clears throat> A little bit um, more detail on, on uh, each access plan operator in the graph. So these operators uh, have two major components. We call their arguments and their and their properties. And the arguments are things that tell the DB2 runtime how how to execute that operator. So if it's a sort, for example, uh, what are the sort keys to sort on? If it's a <clears throat> if it's a uh, uh, a table queue uh, in a database partitioning environment, what are the partitioning columns? Actually, sometimes sorts can have partitioning columns too. Um, you know, for uh, index scans and fetch operations, what are the number of pages to prefetch? So various things like that, which are, you know, kind of directives to, to the DB2 runtime. And then there are things that are called properties. And these, these only exist during the, the construction of the access plan. They don't get passed down to, to the runtime engine. And, you know, they, they help the optimizer, you know, you know, decide how to, how to, how to build the access plan. So things like, you know, which columns are 
projected or flow through the operator? Um, is the stream, is the data stream ordered a particular way at this point? Uh, is it partitioned a particular way? Are certain columns unique? Um, <clears throat> you know, are combinations of columns unique? Uh, what filtering has been applied? Um, you know, maybe there's been a, a fetch first in rows applied, so the stream has a has a maximum cardinality. So, for, so these are you know various you know what we call properties of the of the of the data stream that are very important to optimization. And these properties are important are, are important because <clears throat> they can be exploited to improve uh, performance. Things like order uniqueness and partitioning are are we call they can be very valuable because it takes work to to create them. You know, in order to order the stream, you need, they need to be, the stream needs to be sorted. You know, to partition it uh, in a database partition environment requires using a table queue to move the data around the around the database partitions, and and that's expensive. Um, removing duplicates to to achieve a key in order to satisfy a distinct requirement in the query is also expensive. Um, you know, it either requires a a sort or or a, you know a hash. Uh, unique operation in, in a column organized, uh, you know, system. So either way, it's all expensive. And um, so the, as, as the optimizer considers the different access plans, the more expensive sub plans will be retained uh, uh, if they possess an interesting property. So even though there might be a cheaper plan, uh, a more expensive plan might have a property that's interesting that might make it cheaper further down in processing. So for that reason, it needs to keep these subplans with what we call these interesting properties. And you know what's interesting depends on on the semantics of the, of the query and <clears throat> things that are represented in the query graph. So other other considerations for access plan generation, um, you know, where should the uh, the access uh, execute? Uh, should it execute um, on uh, you know in a database partition environment, is it a co-located join? Uh, you know, does it have to be repartitioned? Does data have to be broadcast? In uh, if you know all systems, um, you know have multiple cores and processors, and if that parallelization feature uh, is enabled, then then the optimizer has to consider various parallelization strategies, um, <clears throat> to which are different different kind of operations within the access plan. In a, in a federated system, certain portions of that query graph of the, or of the query itself can be uh, executed on remote servers. And so it'll have to decide what portion of that to, to push the, to the remote server or what, or what portion of it, uh, you know, could, is better to be done, um, you know, in, in, the D, in the local DB2 engine. And there's different considerations depending on whether the, the, the tables are, are column or, or uh, row organized. So um, another important aspect of uh, access plan generation is is join enumeration, and so this this is the term join, join enumeration basically refers to the search algorithms that are used to to plan joins, and um, you know the the search complexity is going to depend on you know how many tables and 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 how they're connected by by predicates, and so as you probably imagine if you know a query that's referencing you know. You know, dozens of tables, and they're highly interconnected. It 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 will take some time to consider all the different you know you know join permutations. So the DB2 optimizer has two methods available, one called greedy and one called dynamic. So greedy is the is the most efficient method, but it's not computationally exhaustive. So uh, it will get uh, a decent plan uh, fast but it, it could miss some good plans. Dynamic, on the other hand, is exhaustive. It will consider all the options, but it could get expensive for you know, a large or highly connected join graph. So let's go through uh, an example, again, based on, on the original query we used in the, uh, the query read example and, and uh, the access plan generation one. So this is the, um, actually, this is, a, this is a little bit different. I've thrown in, in in a different table and thrown in a, a join to the store dimension. So, um, so on the right hand side, you can see the the original query graph uh, joining store is like, sort of like a fact table. It's a kind of a center 
table in this in this query joined out to these these three dimension tables. So the first thing join enumeration would do was consider all the uh, you know the two way joins. In this case, there's there's only three of them because you know all the tables the other three tables join to uh, store sales. And then once it's you know planned all the two way joins, we'll consider all the three way joins by you know taking those two way joins and then adding in the uh, you know another table giving us the giving us three way. And then finally, it'll you know take those three way joins and add in the fourth table, and then that's considered all all the options. And uh, you can follow the color coding on this graph to kind of see how the different uh, you know join join uh, combinations you know, kind of flowed through the different different phases or steps of uh, join numeration. Greedy. Um, does it differently and it looks at uh, fewer options. So in this case, it still starts with all the two-way joins, but then out of those two-way joins, it will take the single cheapest one and then consider that for the three-way joins. And again, it will take the single cheapest three-way join and use that to, to produce the, the, uh, you know, the final join of all four tables. So you can see that it uh, looks at fewer options um, uh, which uh, you know, because it, it's a trade-off. It could, uh, uh, it'll get the, it'll, it'll, it'll enumerate the joins faster, but <clears throat> it, it might have missed uh, some good joins along the way. So you can control the uh, join enumeration method using uh, optimization classes. Uh, the optimization classes also control a, num a number of other things, but probably the most important one is is the join enumeration. So the the default optimization level is five within DB2, and that one will use dynamic join enumeration. And um, that and that's usually fine. Only only when queries get, you know, very, have a very, a large number of table references and they're highly interconnected, will the uh, preparation time start to, to slow down. And in that case, um, you could uh, drop the optimization class to two uh, which is basically this you know, very similar to five, except it uses greedy in, instead of uh, dynamic. Otherwise, there's a few other levels that are somewhat specialized. You know, with the, on the on the upper end, there's kind of what I, I would call more of an experimental level. It's nine, so it throws every possible. It opens up every possible optimization uh, without any consideration of of um, memory or time, and um, so it could it could result in quite a long prepare time, but you know maybe in some extreme cases it'll it'll find a, a better access path. And then on the lower end are some opt level settings that you know are you know for some very very minimal optimization for you know for example very very simple OLTP applications. And then there's you know some stuff in the middle. I'm not going to go through it all today. My main takeaway on this page would uh, the uh, Default optimization level of five tends to be the best for for most systems. Uh, if the only time I really see it ever being changed is due to long prepare times, where you know could get dropped down to op level two. But the recommendation for the most part would be to to stick with uh, the default of op level five. Okay, <clears throat> so next I'm going to talk about uh, how the optimizer models the cost of different operators. So um, the, the optimizer has like a, a very detailed model for each of the access plan operators. And the, um, it, uh, the, what, the, one of the most important uh, <clears throat> considerations in the cost model is the estimate of the number of rows processed by each operator. And we refer to that as, as cardinality, and that's the term you'd see in the documentation and, and in the explained information. And in order to compute the cardinality, it uh, has to compute the, uh, the filtering of the, of the predicates. And so it, you know, this, this estimate is called a, a filter factor or, or selectivity. Now, so the, the, the predicate filtering and the cardinality estimates are the, are the most important factor in determining an operator's cost. Um, you know, as you can imagine that it, it's, you know, the, you know, if it's only processing one or two rows, it's going to be very quick. If it's processing a billion rows, well, it's going to it's going to be literally like a billion times more expensive. So the um, so the the overall cost then is computed by um, you know estimating the different 
runtime, the cost of the different runtime components. So the CPU, the IO and the communication, and it sums them together to come up with something we you know, call the cost. I'm gonna, and I'm gonna show a specific example uh, on this page. So here's a very simplified uh, costing example for, um, you know, it's just a table scan, scanning the customer table, looking for uh, states of North Carolina. And so uh, what I'm trying to show on this page is um, how kind of costing is done at a kind of a very sort of high level and where the optimizer gets the information it uses in the cost model. So um, the optimizer gets the information from three main places, from the uh, database manager configuration, <clears throat> which in this case is where the, uh, the CPU speed is uh, registered. It also gets some information about the uh, characteristics of the IO subsystem from the system catalogs, from um, the storage groups and the table space catalogs. And then it gets lots and lots of statistics about the table and the data itself from the sysstat views. So we'll just walk through this cost model example. Uh, you know, the most important cost here is the IO cost. So this table's got, you know, 50,000 pages. So there's, go, there's a cost to uh, transfer each page into memory. And that, that, this, that information comes from the, you know, the page size that we know is defined for the, for the table space and the device read rate, which is associated with the storage group. And then there's also a, a cost to locate um, <clears throat> each ex extent worth of pages. Um, and so the, the time to, to, to basically do that, uh, that lookup is represented by the overhead uh, parameter. Again, that, that, that's either at the storage group or the table space level. And so, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the concept of kind of a lookup uh, has become far more abstract, you know, over, over the years, you know, back in the, in the old days when there was just a single disc and, you know, the head had to move across the disc, you know, there was, you know, latency to do that. But even with modded, modern storage subsystems and, and even, uh, you know, flash storage, SSDs, there's still, you know, kind of a concept of, of looking up where the where the data resides and then the cost to, to transfer it. And then the other component of the cost is the CPU. So, you know, the, you know, these relational operations, uh, you know, have to have to use CPU to, to, to do them. So, you know, a table scan will take some instructions to, to, you know, find the, the data and copy it and apply the predicates. You know, there's a, there's a, you know, the predicate cost will occur for every row. And then after the, you know, after the rows have been filtered, then there'll be, you know, maybe a data co copy cost on the, on the rows uh, that, pa that satisfy the predicate. And so all those costs will be added together to produce uh, uh, total cost. And let's <clears throat> talk a little bit more about what that total cost is. So each, uh, uh, each of the cost components, so whether it's IO, communication, CPU, is modeled using basically milliseconds, and then these cost components are summed. And so, of course, the you know the sum of these costs doesn't represent the true elapsed time because each of these cost components, CPU and I/O, are going to be executing concurrently. And uh, you know, and, and even within you know if you, even within the CPU component itself and the I/O, there's parallelism that that's occurring. So, rather than uh, calling this cost milliseconds. Uh, within explain, we, we, we give, give it this unit called a, a timer on, and it's just a made up name, so it's not mistaken for elapsed time. But really it's, it's just comprised of this, as the sum of these different system components. And so then why is a timer on a, a better cost met, metric than, a, than elapsed time? Well, the timer on represents the total system resources required to you know, compute the query. And it's a it's a preferred system metric, uh, assuming uh, a, con a concurrent you know that concurrent queries are running on on the system, which is typically the case. Most systems are are multi-user, and it usually correlates to elapsed time as well. So that's that's why that's chosen as as the cost metric. 
Um, there are some exceptions where the optimizer does a computation that's more like elapsed time than uh, resource consumption. Uh, the major one is for uh, in, a, in a database partitioned uh, environment, the total cost there uh, is, is uh, the resource consumption per database partition. And the reason this is done is that it uh, encourages access plans that uh, are distributed across more of the database partitions because that's you know why such systems are, are used in the in the first place and then there's uh, some other cases for example if the optimize for n rows or fetch first n rows is used then the uh, optimizer will try to choose plans that return you know those n rows fastest rather than the 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 cheapest cost to return all the rows produced by the plan. So just a um, little example on on why uh, how the costing works in a in an MPP environment. So the, as I mentioned, the cost is per database partition, and so you know the idea is is that uh, you know if the you know if you have to scan uh, you know a thousand rows and they're on four four nodes. You know, it's going to be a quarter of the cost because all those all those scans are are occurring in in, in parallel, and so uh, you know as data is uh, as it flows through the access plan, the optimizer can choose to you know part you know part, repartition the stream to send it out to multiple nodes, and you know there's a cost to doing that, but then on the other hand, uh, you know the, there's the benefit of all those you know that stream running in in parallel, so that's that's why. Uh, that cost metric is used in a in an MPP environment. Uh, I'm going to skip this page because I'm <clears throat> kind of hitting the top of the hour. So this is just some of the stuff I've already talked about. Um, some of the optimizer awareness, the speed of the CPU, and the storage device characteristics. Um, spend a few minutes on this page. So storage I/O characteristics, as I mentioned, uh, they're registered at the storage group and the table space level. Um, the overhead value is the same. Um, there is one difference between the cost for transferring data. So storage groups were, were uh, introduced into DB2 um, after table spaces. Table spaces have existed since the beginning. Um, the metric that, you, that was used for uh, transferring data for table spaces was transfer rate. Um, the one problem with that is that it depended on the page size. So the unit was milliseconds per page and uh, sometimes, uh, you know, users didn't, when they set the value, they didn't take into account the size of the page. So, you know, for example, a 32K page is, is going to take, you know, eight times longer to transfer than a, than a 4K page. So that's why with the introduction of storage groups, um, the metric was changed to device read rate, which is just, you know, megabytes per second, and it doesn't depend on the uh, page size. And so, you know, the you know DB2 can knows what the page size is and <clears throat> can compute the the transfer speed uh, accordingly. So so it's better better to set the uh, that parameter at the storage group group level and the default values for the for automatic storage table spaces will inherit it from the the storage group. Otherwise, if you do set it at the at the table space level, you know, be careful to to adjust that value for different page sizes. Um, this point, I'm going to skip this one as well. Um, so Martin, I guess I'm at the <clears throat> top of the hour now. Uh, I had a few more pages, but I think- uh, I Well, think you can go till 12.15 uh, uh, if you want. We, we don't, certainly don't mind you covering more material. I've never heard a, in fact, I've never heard that somebody on the D2, DB2 Night Show complain that they got too much material. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure if it was a hard stop at the top of the hour. Nope. Okay, yeah. I think I, Give you at least another ten minutes, if not twenty. Okay, great. Thank Thanks. I think I think I can finish by then. Okay. All right. So uh, next aspect of uh, optimization I want to talk about is uh, the planning and modeling of uh, predicate application. So as I mentioned earlier, generally the optimizer tries to apply predicates as early as possible. So you want to filter rows from the stream to avoid un unnecessary work downstream. So push them as close to the the, the you know the source is as possible. <clears throat> well, one of the one of the issues though is that some types of predicates can only be applied in certain certain locations and during query execution, so they, they they can't go down as far as others. 
And so for that reason, there's a, there's a hierarchy of predicate application and uh, the explain facility will, will show you exactly where, where predicates are applied at each at each step of the plan. So this page shows the uh, hierarchy of predicate application. Um, so the, the you know the the predicates that are pushed the furthest down are at the the bottom of the screen. So uh, that triangle represents a an index access. And so the you know the most efficient way to apply a search condition is as as a start stop key. On, on an index. So that just, the, you know, the start stop key basically is the, indicates, you know, the starting and ending position within within the index where, where to start looking for rows. Um, the next most efficient one would be to apply a, a filter condition on each key or each qualifying key in the index. We call that an index sargable predicate. So sarg is just a, just a, an acronym or a name based on the term search argument. And so we've got this notion of index surrogable predicates. So you could, you know, a query could first apply some start stop keys to, to narrow the, the rows down to a, a certain set. And then it could apply another filter um, on a different column, assuming it's in the index as it is in this case uh, to further uh, filter rows. And then there could be some additional search conditions on columns that aren't in the index, and those will be applied directly on the data pages in the buffer pool. And so in this case, there might be like a like predicate on name, and those uh, that predicate uh, can be done uh, after the page is read into the buffer pool. And then finally, the most expensive predicate is something you know called a residual predicate and those for the most part are subquery predicates that haven't been transformed to a join and those have to be done up in the uh, what we call the well the RDS stands for the the basically the the DB2 runtime and uh, so the optimizer is aware of all of that and you can see all of that uh, in explain so as I mentioned earlier the most <clears throat> part of the most important uh, part of uh, the input to, to costing an access plan is the estimate of the number of rows. And the optimizer produces this estimate for uh, each operator in the plan. And it's uh, based on the number of rows in the table and the fil filter factor of each of the predicates. And uh, this is the single most in, uh, <clears throat> biggest impact on the cost. And uh, the filter factor, the information for the filter factor comes from the uh, catalog statistics. So let's talk uh, a little bit about these catalog statistics. So the statistics are probably the most important piece of information for uh, costing access plans. They're used to compute the, both the cost and the cardinality. And the, these statistics uh, uh, kind of be grouped into two main categories. There's, there's a set of statistics that represent the, the physical characteristics of the database objects, like the tables and indexes. So, for example, the number of pages in the table, number of levels in an index, that type of thing. And then there's statistics about the data itself. So how many rows are in the table, how many distinct values that are in a column, uh, the distribution of the data. <clears throat> so those are the data statistics. And uh, DB2 has, uh, you know, a few stats collection methods. Uh, well, basically it's got the run stats command, or you can let DB2 collect the statistics automatically by enabling auto run stats. And so the, and there's a couple of different, you know, flavors of auto run stats. Um, there's, you know, the auto run stats that uh, collect stats in the background uh, every two hours, or there's something called real-time stats where the optimizer will actually generate a run stats request, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, like in the middle of query optimization. And those can be controlled by database configuration parameters. And then these statistics are stored in the system catalogs in uh, basically five uh, sysstat views. And I'll just quickly step through them on the next couple of pages. So I'm not going to go through every statistic, uh, just giving an idea of what you'd find in sysstat.tables. So this one's got the number of rows in the table, number of pages, a number of pages with uh, with rows, total number of pages, a variety of other metrics. I'm not going to go into in great depth now. 
And then we look at the stats with the individual columns. So the more most important stats here would be things like the number of distinct values in a column, the highest, the second highest and second lowest uh, values in the column, you know, the average length of the column, number of nulls, and then also have statistics about the indexes themselves. So the <clears throat> number of leaf pages in the index, the number of levels, and uh, probably most one of the more important stats is how well the data pages are clustered with respect to that index. So there's a couple of uh, clustering metrics that are also recorded. And all these stats are input into the cost model. So this page <clears throat> looks a little bit complicated, but this just shows a, a, a basic um, cardinality estimation example. And it's uh, just a simple, <clears throat> excuse me, two, two way join applying a, a, a simple uh, local search conditioner predicate. <clears throat> so let's look at the, 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 um, uh, the local predicate in red. So it's looking for all X values uh, equal to seven. So in this case, uh, we happen to have distribution statistics on that column. So that's the purple box at the bottom. And, you know, it has a count that says um, <clears throat> value seven occurs, you know, four times in the table. And the stats say there's, you know, 10 rows in the table. So they're easy to, you know, come up with, come up with a computation that, you know, just says it's going to occur, you know, four out of 10 times. So it's got a filter factor of, uh, 0.04. And then we look at the uh, <clears throat> the uh, join predicates, that's the, the predicate in green, jo joining the columns on Y. And that computation uh, is based on the number of distinct values in the in the Y columns. So in this case, <clears throat> excuse me, there are um, 10 distinct values. Um, There are 10 uh, distinct values on, uh, on T, in T1.y and five in uh, T2.y. And so the, um, the computation will be one over, you know, the largest number of distinct values between those two columns. So in this case, it'll, the filtering will be one over 10. And why is that chosen? That's chosen because the, the, the filter factor uh, computation makes two assumptions. One, that all the values um, in the column with the smaller number of distinct values are included in the domain of uh, all the values uh, that have the larger number of distinct values. So in this, you know, this case, you know, all the t2.ys exist in the t1.ys, and that the um, values are un uniformly distributed in in uh, in the columns. And so for this simple example, that's that's the case. So uh, to compute the cardinality of that join then, it's the, you know, the size of the tables multiplied by the, the, the filter factor selectivity of those two search conditions. And uh, the answer is four, which is what it is in reality. Now, this is a simple example that makes some assumptions and it uh, might not hold in reality. And there are a variety of ways uh, and other st more sophisticated statistics to correct for that, that uh, beyond the scope of today's presentation, but uh, this page was just meant to you know, show you a, a simple example of how <clears throat> filter factors and cardinalities are estimated. Um, finally, getting to the last part of the presentation, just wanna say a few words on the explain facility. So this is a, an internal phase of uh, the optimizer that captures, you know, the information about the access plan and the query transformation, and is written to uh, a set of tables <clears throat> that you can you can create uh, with some DDL in uh, that's you know shipped with the DB2, or there's a store procedure to uh, to create these tables. And there's generally two major tools used to format uh, and see this explained information, and then you. You know, saw them mentioned in the uh, poll at the start of the start of the session. So there's a visual explain that uh, you know, gives you a nice graphical representation, and there's uh, part of uh, the, the DB2 data management console. Um, and this uh, you've probably seen, you know, prior versions of this visual explain. There was one that uh, 
it's part of Data Server Manager and was part of Data Studio. Um, <clears throat> so it has uh, evolved over the years. And there's also a, a text-based version um, used based on DB2 EXFOT. And uh, they both provide exactly the same information because they're sourced on the explained tables. There's just, you know, one's a nice uh, GUI and the other one is uh, text-based. Now I know in that poll, uh, saw a number of people that like to use uh, DB2 EXPLN. That's actually, I mean, it shows similar information, but it doesn't have all the information that the explain facility has. So in order to really understand the optimizer decisions, especially cardinality estimates and, and filtering, it's uh, better to use you know, either Visual Explainer or, or DB2 EXFMT. Uh, so this page shows you know, uh, what, a, what an access plan would look like using the data management uh, console Visual Explain. So you know, each node represents various things like you know, sorts and joins and table scans, and then you can click each one and, and you can see these, these arguments and properties that I, that I discussed in the presentation. And um, John, sure. I've got a question here from Chuck, and this is a. I'm not. This will probably take a bit of back and forth to make sure we we get this through. This uh, on optimization classes, we have an, an LUW application package that generates a lot of dynamic, non-parametized uh, queries. Uh, one result: the queries need to be parsed for every execution. Um, is there a recommendation for this type of application? Well, unless the uh, <clears throat> the parsing time is excessive and you're not getting uh, good hits in the dynamic statement cache, um, I would just leave it as is because the you know having the the original literals is is better for optimization. If if uh, preparation time is is a problem. Uh, DB2LUW does have a, a statement concentrator feature where it would uh, basically parameterize the, the queries for you. Uh, okay, um, Chuck, I hope that's uh, good enough for you. If not, ask some more questions and we can figure it out. Thanks. All right. And so this page has moved on is just a you know quick example of what the access plan looks like in DPT EXFMT. You know, same information. It's just a you know very simple text-based graph. Uh, you know, some folks like to use it. It's a little easier to to you know transfer around and and uh, <clears throat> maybe more usable in some cases than than a GUI. And I think this is kind of the last page I have. Uh, the thing I wanted to mention about uh, what the explain facility shows is is um, it actually does show the query graph after query transformation, and this is uh, represented as the optimized SQL section within within the uh, uh, explain information. And you can see this both with the, with the visual tools or DB2 EXFMT. And this basically show it does show the query graph after the query transformation. We've just you know reverse and you know, we've just regenerated the SQL based on that internal query graph. And here you can see the uh, transformations that I had mentioned uh, earlier in the in the presentation where the the expressions were you know pre-computed and the um, correlated not exist subquery was was transformed to a an anti-join. In this case you'd see it as a as a red order join. A bit of an eye test, but uh, if if, uh, if you take a close look at it you can see all those transformations I I had mentioned earlier. And that that wraps it up, Martin. So I think I <clears throat> pretty close to twelve fifteen. Uh, you did really well. That's great information as always, John. Appreciate you doing. Um, uh, and um, I'm, I'm just looking at. Uh, there's just a few more questions that came in just as you finished up here. Let me uh, scroll up and make sure I get them all. Uh, I've got a, and a question on the statement concentrator. Uh, why is the concentrator not working uh, with predicates? We get very few dynamic statement cache hits, and the, the package vendor recommends against the statement contract uh, concentrator. I, I don't. So I don't know why it's not not working in that particular case. It 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 works fine in many cases. I've seen many other customers use it in a. I don't. I, I don't know why. 
the yeah. contractor or I, I I don't want to speak ill of it either because there are times when it does help but I've I've had some customers that have chosen to turn it off and have had some problems uh, uh, experience in the field does seem to vary a little bit on it some people like it some people have problems with it I'm just putting it out there I'm I'm not uh, it's Friday morning here. It's kind of a gray day, and maybe I'm not being as uh, lucid as I could be on that. But I have uh, seen yes statement concentrator, and I've seen emphatically no statement con or don't use the statement concentrator. I'm just putting it out there for now. And uh, but this yeah, I mean, I guess my one one comment on that is that. Um... Okay. Yeah. John, you still there? Or... It looks like you might be writing something. Huh. Okay, I'm going to take back control at this point anyway. So I'm not hearing John right now, and I do want to uh, give people back their day. Um, I'll show my screen. And the other thing I wanted to do, though, is uh, just in terms of wrapping up the show at this point, uh, what I'd uh, like to do is ask our final question that we always ask at the end of every show, which is, did you learn anything today? And as always, we have a high percentage of people that do, and we'll share that result. And 88% uh, of our audience uh, learned something today. And that's just great. That's what we always like to see. And uh, uh, let me move on and show my uh, final, uh, hide that and go back to the, just say our show is sponsored by DBI Software. Our, they're our uh, founding sponsor of the DB2 Night Show, and we always thank them for their uh, support of, of the DB2 community. So thanks for that. Let me cue the music and we'll uh, thank John once again. I don't know where John, uh, he seems to have gone a little silent there. I don't know if he's got a microphone problem, but uh, thanks again, John. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your efforts in supporting the show and the DB2 community. So with that, I'm going to turn up the music. Wish everybody a great weekend, and we'll see you uh, in two weeks for a DB2Z show on, uh, on data structures. And then uh, don't forget Piotr Versajewski in May for the LUW show. Thank you and goodbye to everyone. Bye-bye.